Hey everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Go. I'm your host Christina Jung. And I'm Anand Chandy and on this episode we're going to go mile high. Well, Christina, that's the sound of Skyfest, and it's back in Pernal for a fourth time. Can you believe that thousands of people show up here to check out the Skyhawks, the Snowbirds, the CF-18 display, and the civilian aircraft that go up to actually showcase their aeronautical maneuvers and stuff? This is just amazing. Mm -hmm. It sure is an incredible weekend. But you know what? There is one person in particular, one lady actually, that makes sure all of wait, this gets wait. put... Wait, wait. It's just one person who makes sure that all of those planes stay up in the sky instead of crashing into each other and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's one lady and we got a chance to catch up with the air boss herself. My job is the air boss and that's kind of like the director of a play. I take care of all the briefings, the debriefings, all the scheduling and I control the aircraft. If I'm not here, it's kind of like the person with the top hat. If they don't show up at the circus, it all gets confused. I got started in uh, airbossing way back in the Vanderhoof days. I was uh, lucky enough to be the airboss in the early 90s. <laughs> and uh, then I just progressed and did more and more and more. And now I do anywhere from eight to 12 shows a year all over North America. My responsibility is to keep both the pilots and the, the spectators safe. So that's what I do. Daryl, there's some thought on the runway. Down the this is mostly a male dominated field, so it's very unusual for a woman to be an air boss. And I think I'm the only one that does this for a living in North America. I've been doing it for so long, it's very natural for me, but I do go from site to site. And some of the new show sites are, they're a little bit more overwhelmed. Women are very good at doing this. We, we are very good at task oriented and keeping organized. And that's part of an air boss's job. And I'd love to see more women do this. Wasn't she amazing? Isn't she like a rock star? Yeah, but she's not the only one who keeps this show running like clockwork. I actually caught up with these guys and they call themselves the pit bosses. Wow, pit bosses. Pretty cool name, hey? What they do is they keep these planes refueled and they also try to keep the pilots calm so that they can put on the best possible performance for the crowds that show up here. Pit bosses, that's a pretty cool job title. Can I be a pit boss? I think you should just stick with Shaw TV for now. Aww. Let's go check out the story. I don't know. I'm the civilian pit boss and uh, that's uh, looking after the civilian performers and their airplanes, uh, and that involves refueling them and putting the smoke oil in them and just looking after some of the uh, primary needs of the uh, pilots. I'm in charge of the military hot pit. Our responsibilities are to uh, assist in the fueling and the marshalling of the aircraft and any requirements that they need for ground support that we're capable of doing for them. Welcome to Cornell! <laughs> James Keith, pleased to meet you. Jerry contacted me in the first, to help with the first show in about 2013 and we were there just as more of a volunteer capacity and then the next shows after that our responsibilities increased as it went so. Well, I was a member of the Quinell Flying Club uh, in 2010. We uh, put on our first air show, and uh, I was uh, asked to look after the pits, and I've uh, been doing that ever since. Just being a pilot helps, and uh, being an air show fan, and being around air shows, and uh, that put it all together, uh, that's a start, and then you learn as you go. Okay, we've never fueled one of these up before, so you'll have oh, to, we'll, we'll take you guys can out. take care of it. Had no idea. Went in cold and had a pretty steep learning curve, but uh, we got through it, and it gets a little easier every time. Yes. The civilian pit boss looks after civilian aircraft, uh, which is much more relaxed and uh, more fun 
Uh, the military pits, uh, it's quite regulated. They have uh, rule books. For instance, the snowbirds, when they are 45 minutes before they fly, uh, the whole uh, area around the snowbirds on the apron is restricted. There's only uh, one civilian allowed in. They do uh, an FOD sweep over the whole thing and they go through all their pre-flight and they don't want any distractions given the nature of uh, how critical every uh, step is towards it. The F-18 is a little more relaxed. They do their uh, maintenance instantly when it comes in the aircraft fueled and basically they're on standby until it's ready to fly again. We don't associate so much with the pilots. Uh, it's more with the ground crew and the support of the aircraft and that sort of thing. We have to kind of watch is uh, just make sure that the, that the pilot is uh, calm and focused and uh, just try and keep him. Uh, we don't bother them, we leave them alone for the first 30 minutes before the show so that they can concentrate on, uh, on what they're doing. I love aircraft, I always have, and it's just a way of uh, getting to be involved with them when you're not a pilot or in the aviation circle. So it's my once a year airplane fix. Just meeting the, the, the pilots and the performers is uh, quite exciting and uh, getting to uh, talk with them and get to know their aircraft get to know them personally, that, that's been good. Welcome back to Go, and I'm here with Frank. Frank, what are we standing in front of? Set in front of the CF-18 Hornet. And can you tell me a little bit about this beautiful piece of machinery here? Yes, um, this is Canada's uh, lead fighter. Um, we have uh, we use it for multi roles uh, in different parts of the world. Right now, it's painted up to commemorate the 75 years of the Battle of Britain, and uh, we're touring with the CF-18 demo team to uh, show this uh, beautiful airplane. And I was talking to a couple of guys at the air show, and they told me that the same plane isn't used for more than a year and for air shows and stuff like that. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Well, in this case, we've used this one last year as well. Uh, there's a good chance we might use it next year. I, I, well, we'll see when we get there. But uh, typically, one airplane is used for one season. Is there a reason why you use just one airplane for a season? It will depend on uh, what we call fleet on the hours uh, on the airplane. I mean, um, each airplane will age at a different, uh, different rate. This one happens to be a very low experience, very low flight hours. So this is why we use this one. Awesome, okay. And do you typically do shows in smaller communities like Quesnel? Uh, we do tons of shows here. Um, just with a smaller runway, it's we need guys with uh, the resting hook, the, the resting gear, so we can actually land. But uh, typically, we don't operate under 6,000 feet. Now, that's really interesting that you mentioned that. Can you tell me how this you know, interacts with the resting gear? If, if, if you could show me, that would even be better. Yeah, um, we can walk around or I can show you right now if you yeah. want. Can you tell me a little bit about how this little piece works here with in relation to the arresting crew? So what happens is when the, the pilot select hook down in the cockpit, this whole assembly right here will lower and we'll, this will actually rub on the ground. So this shoe that I'm pointing out right here will actually rub on the ground and just on the forward face where my hands are, the cable will actually, actually get trapped, thus slowing the airplane down. And does the pilot feel anything in the cockpit when that happens? Oh yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very good deceleration rate. And would you do a show in a community like Cornell with a smaller runway like this if there wasn't an arrest crew in place? Typically not. Um, we are we, we we don't like coming into small areas, small uh, fields. Uh, we the yeah, the the resting gear really make well. We make sure that we are able to come in and land. It. So we're able to stop in a very very short distance, as you probably saw when the, our backup airplane landed, right? That's right. I not only saw it right now, I actually got to see it yesterday when I was down there filming a story with the Arrestor crew. So let's go check the story out and see what the Arrestor crew actually does. The CF-18, 
It's pretty much the main event outside of the Snowbirds at Quinell Sky Fest. Yes, it's hard to imagine the show without the hair-raising, negative G-pushing thrills the CF-18 demo team produces. But this aircraft wouldn't have been able to come to Quinell if Sergeant Jason Swanson and his barrier team weren't there. His team helps catch the CF-18 with their arresting gear and stop it before it overruns this short 5,000-foot runway. It's, uh, it's called a MOS system. It's a mobile aircraft arresting system. Uh, it's used for uh, mobile stuff for uh, any uh, runway that doesn't have any aircraft's arresting systems on it. And it's all staked in. And uh, what it does is we can put a cable across the runway and the jet will use it just in case he has an emergency or if he has any problems there, he can use the uh, cable to stop himself. Similar to the systems used on aircraft carriers, arrested systems have come a long way since they were first introduced in 1911. It's widely used in the military and at air shows, and the newer hydraulic systems make them easier to use. We're facing, uh, we have it throughout the Canadian forces on bases in Comox, Coal Lake, uh, Bagaville, Greenwood, Goose Bay, but we also use it in the northern locations there, where uh, in the winter months there, when the runways get very icy there, so they're up in Inuvik, Iqaluit, and Yellowknife. So what exactly does the arrest crew do, and who are they? It's called the barrier team there. So what it is, we bring a team of us, and we just run the gear. Um, I'm the team leader right now, and then we have a few other guys with us. We have two firefighters with us here that will go in the, actually get the jet off the cable on that. And basically our job as firefighters here is uh, once the uh, jet catches the cable, our job is my, myself, I will go out actually to the runway to the front of the jet and I'll do hand signals with the pilot and I'll get him off the cable. 73 William Sick Radio. Uh, if it For Dave and his partner, being a part of the arrested crew isn't part of their regular job. It's shows like this that give them the experience that they need. It's different. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie, it is a little different. It's not one of our main jobs. Our main job is on the base. We provide firefighting for the base and for the airfields on base. Jason, on the other hand, is Canada's only certified team leader for aircraft arresting systems. I've, I've been doing it off and on for about seven years now, but the last four years, I've, this is all I've been doing there, I've just been concentrating on it, so we've been traveling around Canada. Uh, we had a team go to Romania when the jets went over there and uh, deployed the gear there as well. The travel isn't the only part that comes with this job though. The most fun part of what I do is uh, ultimately serving, the, uh, serving Canada. Uh, I love the Canadian forces, I love being a firefighter. Hanging out with everyone there too, you become a tight crew. Uh, you do a lot of stuff together. You, it's interesting work. It's always different. You're always outside. Um, you get to meet all the pilots and everything. Uh, you get to go in the planes, jets if you want to and all that. And you, have, you probably have the best seat for the air show too because you're sitting right on the side of the runway. So we're here at the Mother Load Car Wash. Um, everyone from pilots to Lamborghini drivers are all here actually for CHAPS. And I'm sitting here with Edie from CHAPS. Um, Edie, can you tell us what CHAPS is all about? Okay. Um, first of all, CHAPS stands for Caribou Hoofbeats Assisted Activity Program Society. And basically what we do is we use uh, dogs and horses uh, and we take advantage of their empathetic and uh, generous natures and we work with um, people, children, uh, adults and elderly people who have challenges. We're just happy to sponsor something, a little bit of everything. Classic cars are here, 
our the charity Chaps is here. We've got a booth set up, um, and we just love to welcome our, our visitors to Quinell, the, oh, awesome. the car drivers and the pilots. Awesome. It's for the Sky Fest, um, and we were just uh, as the South Quinell Business Association, we wanted to do something uh, for Quinell, and we decided that uh, Chaps would be good to do that. And this was a great opportunity to get everyone from town and people from out of town to come and enjoy this and help support a local um, charity. So tell us, uh, you guys are here for a fundraiser today. Tell us how the proceeds work and, and where it goes, I guess. Well, um, the, pro the, the proceeds will go to our programs, um, either the dog or the horse program. Typically the dog program is mostly volunteer based uh, and the dogs are privately owned so we don't have a lot of expenses there. Uh, in our horse program, our therapeutic riding program, we own two horses and so their care is a constant burden. Um, we, we run about 20 weeks of programs a year but the horses have to be cared for throughout the year because we, we own them. Well, speaking of helping others, our next story is about Hope Air, an airline service that helps seniors and children uh, fly to the coast for special services or special type of surgery. Take a look. James has always been my busy one. He's a good little boy, but he's always busy. Nine-year-old James Roy is like your average kid in every way. Whether he's slaying virtual demons on the Wii or getting dirty with his puppy Chase, James is just happy to make the most of the life around him. And did I mention how much he loves fishing? I, was, I saw a guy fishing on the dock last the, the one night and they're all jumping so I asked my dad if he could, if I could go out just my mom was in Prince George and she was going to bring back Kentucky Fried Chicken so we didn't eat dinner, so we were waiting for her. And I went out and pulled out my rod, got some worms, and I came out and the second guy, another guy showed up and I was fishing, fishing. I put my worm on, first cast, as I got one. But like every other kid, James has chores too. He helps his mom, dad, and brother look after Fishpot Lake Resort, a property they manage in a remote area just outside of Nazco. <laughs> in this little piece of heaven, James lives the life that most kids dream of, carefree and full of adventure. I just go up to the crawl up there. I just go up to the crawl and then turn up to the gate, actually, and then turn around and come back. Back down and I head up into our top tier because then you you can see the fresh air and see animals and stuff like there's if there's a bunny or a or, or a bird or something. You have to look out for him. He's a goof. It's that big we do everything. We do hunting. We do fi fishing. We do everything together. I guess. And Dad, it's like a big tree song. Dad, did you see that? The last few years, though, have been far from normal or peaceful for James and his family. Just as James was getting into kindergarten, he started to find that his heart couldn't keep up with his highly active lifestyle. You know, it's weird, because I guess in some ways, maybe as a mom, you always know something's a little bit wrong. Once a year, almost every single year, I've taken him to the doctors and said, you know, something funny happened over the weekend. It's like he just kind of turned a really weird shade of, shade of gray. His lips are kind of blue and you can watch his chest beating crazy. Um, you can see his heart just really going full tilt. Biking, I do feel unwell sometimes. It's because it takes, I'm working and my body just goes ugh. One time I just came in and we, I lie down on the couch and we went to watch a movie and, and I just, my heart went like crazy. These episodes would last for anywhere between 30 minutes to two hours. After the frequency of the episodes increased from once over a couple of months to almost twice a day, Mark and Victoria decided to drive James to Quinell to get a diagnosis. By the time you get to Quinell, Quinell is an hour and a half from our home, um, he's sort of finished and fine and smiling and laughing with the doctors. And you're saying, gosh, you know, you didn't see him an hour and a half ago. You didn't see what I was seeing, so. And you can't do anything. You can't take him to the hospital because it's, it's always never knowing. After six well, months, James was referred to a doctor in Prince George who suggested that James be taken to Vancouver. 
James went to Vancouver in the Northern Health bus with his mum, a 14-hour one-way trip. James had been talking about the bus to the lady there, and she told us about Hope Air. And she said Hope Air was for middle-class families or low-income families needing to get to medical appointments. Hope Air has been around since 1986. It isn't really an airline. Through their network of volunteer pilots and volunteer ambassadors, they arrange free flights for Canadians to access health care they desperately need. Last year, 25 people in Kunal used Hope Air apart from James. That's over $26,000 in flights. The plane was definitely cool. That was a whole new, you know, wow, there's mountains and clouds and little cars and people walking around. That was fun. <laughs> you can look down and see the, the little cars and the buildings. So this is across Canada. It's across BC. It's across anywhere. And to have someone find a way to get you from a rural area to a big city center, to me, was huge. In Kunal, I'm Anand Chandy for Shaw TV. I'm from uh, Williams Lake and I'm an airplane buff and I brought uh, both my airplanes up here to put on static display for the air shows. Well, I brought my airplanes up for the first Skyfest, so I've been here every year since. This aircraft behind us is a, what they call a beach stanger wing. It's a D-17S and it was built in 1943 for the U.S. and they used it as their VIP airplane throughout the Second World War. For military, they usually had two pilots and then the general sat in the back seat and whether he had his secretary with him or not. I started with the, with the Stearman, which is a poor man's warbird and I found one in Wichita, Kansas and um, in parts and I brought it home and uh, did a total restoration on it and, and from ground up and that's how I got started. It's my life. I, uh, I work on them whenever I have spare time from the ranch so it's just my passion to, to um, have airplanes, see airplanes, and be around people that are involved with airplanes. So we want to keep civil aviation um, healthy and, and vibrant, and that's what we're all about. Coming up, pilot Ken Fowler tells us how he built his plane from the ground up. I built this one. I built it. I mean, this airplane here started off, it's, it's all metal. It started off as a, a pile of aluminum. For me, I was military. We supported the Skyhawk parachute team, and that got me into the airshow world. And then on top of it, I had an aerobatic airplane, one prior to this one, that I just love doing aerobatics in. Wow. So I love the aerobatics, I love the airshow world, and put the two together, and I started flying airshows with this airplane. So is it safe to say that you have no fear of heights? I, I, I wouldn't totally say that. <laughs> I'll, I'll call it a respect for heights. Uh -huh. But I, I, I mean, you'd be surprised how many airship performers do have a genuine fear of heights. Wow. Like to build a walk over to the edge of a building, not, you know. <laughs> but, you know, we're strapped into an airplane. It's a little bit different when you're strapped in and you're familiar with your machine. Mm -hmm. So. And you're really familiar with this baby behind us, aren't you? Oh, you yeah. said you made this from scratch. Well, I built this. I mean, this airplane here started off, it's, it's all metal. It started off as a, a pile of aluminum, you know, and, and, I, and I built the airplanes. It's, it's, all, it's all riveted together. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I've been flying it since 1997. Tell us some of the details. Can you take us around and kind of show us some of the details you've put into this? I mean, the thing is, I mean, the, the fuel is carried all the leading edges of the wing. Um, it's, it's a very simple airplane, but it's very clean. Aerodynamically, it's a very clean airplane, so it's very fast. This airplane, I cruise at about 240 miles per hour when I'm going cross country. When I'm flying uh, in an air shawl, I hit 300 to 320 miles per hour. So it is a very, very fast airplane. How did you get to making one of these on your own? Um, well, there are uh, airplanes available, designs that are available, and lot, you'd be surprised how many people build their own airplanes. Um, now, there's not very many people that build their own airplanes and then fly air shows with them. You know, yeah. that's that's just a, a whole different step. You yeah. know, but uh, but this airplane here is uh, I've been flying air shows with it, like I said, since '97. Oh wow! What is it about you know this entire world that you fell in love with? 
Well, first love, of course, is, is the flying. You know, every all of us, every all the airshow performers absolutely love the flying. I mean, it is the ultimate form of freedom, but what we do just takes it to a whole new level, you know, where we can show the people what this is all about, you know, and entertain people. So it's flying and entertainment. Um, the camaraderie amongst the uh, uh, airshow performers is, you know, second to none. I've heard of people getting on these things and having to have a puke bag prepared. Well, the thing is, yes, okay. <laughs> if you're if you're really susceptible to motion sickness, you have to take it easy. And and when we go out, we do the media rides and sponsor rides, so we take people like yourself out and let you experience what we do. So we'll go out and we'll turn you upside down for a little bit and just show you what we do. But you do it fast. You throw the person through a bunch of maneuvers and land. Right, make it very quick, and even someone with a weak stomach, for 10 minutes of playing around this guy and then land, you'll be okay. Well, that just about wraps up our special Cornell Sky Fest episode of Go. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. But hey, Anand, didn't you say you had a little surprise for them this week? And I've been waiting all week for this. Get this: for the very first time, Cornell Sky Fest featured a twilight show, and we were out there filming the entire thing. So after today's episode, we're going to show you some of the highlights from that. And if you stay tuned to your local Caribou listings, you can see when we're going to be playing the entire show. Yep, the entire Twilight show. Pretty crazy, eh? Yep. So thank you for watching and catch you next week. <laughs>